Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Glue Stick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time and have a collection of hundreds of monster ecology and strategy videos on my channel. If you like what I do, please consider subscribing as I upload at least twice a week. Today, a special viewer request. Thanks for the email Joseph, this one is for you. There are many ancient evils in the multiverse. I know, I cover most of the things that heroic player characters fight against, but don't worry, there are plenty of forces of good in the multiverse as well, and they are very, very powerful. I have more videos on them coming up soon. The Yugoloths are a diverse group of beings that have spent thousands and thousands of years gaining massive amounts of wealth and power through their profiteering of the most vicious and cutthroat war the multiverse has ever known. The blood war between the Nine Hells and the Abyss. Alongside the Slard, the Yugoloths have a vested interest that this war never ends conclusively, and they really don't care what gets destroyed in the crossfire as long as they come out on top of it with more wealth and power. They are the very model of the neutral evil alignment after all. Most beings in the multiverse view the Yugoloths as greedy mercenaries willing to sell their services to both sides. But behind that public face there is an organisation, there is leadership and there is an agenda. With the members of the highest caste actually directing the entire course of the conflict as their own thing to control and manipulate. One of those high level operators, operators is Asmodeus himself. Others are powerful demon lords and the council of eight Balor generals. And wheeling and dealing goes on in this secret war while the raging open warfare is scattered across space and time. Looking like a chaotic and unchecked brawl between the forces of evil, but it is all orchestrated by those who profit from it the most and until they decide to end it, the warfare will continue eternally unless one group finally decides the time has come to unify the fiendish planes and turn their attention to the ultimate battle against the planes of good. The celestial forces are constantly training and preparing for this time and celestial observers are dispersed across the multiverse watching the blood war and keeping tabs on the infernal movers and shakers very closely. Between the planes of light and the planes of darkness, the prime material worlds are the playground of this game of shadows. Like the Tanari and the Batizu, the Yugoloths have their own rulers, the Baenoloths, who are considered by most sages to be their progenitors. Below the Baenoloths is the ruler of Kivn Oin, also known as the Wasting Tower on the Plain of Hades, who was given the title of Oinlo, Oinoloth. For 3,000 years, one Yugoloth held this position, ruling all from this vile perch on the Siege Malicious, the throne at the apex of the Wasting Tower. I should mention that this location is super creepy. It's constructed from the backbones of a deity. The entire massive tower complex and the throne, which is built to seat superhumanly big humanoids, like Orcus for instance. Thankfully, Orcus has never sat on the thing. Anyone who sits on this throne must be must have killed whoever last sat on it to transfer its power to them, at which point their skin melts away from their body, their raw flesh bubbles with pus-filled blisters and seeping boils, and they gain magical control over all the diseases on this first layer of Hades. The plane called Oinos, also known as the Battle Plane, or the First Gloom of Hades. This has always been the primary battleground of the Blood War, because the river's blood and the river Styx cross over here, and it is basically the middle ground, the No Fiends land that forms a perpetual battlefront. The place is extremely nasty, the ground is soggy mass of countless corpses, and everything is just lousy with disease, this wasting sickness that is super dangerous for any mortals who visit this realm. Visitors uh, who they are frequent to this place, however, it's full of portals, and the fairy surfaces of the Marinoloths, who ply the river Styx, and this is one of the best places to embark on one of their vessels. Numerous gods lurk in lairs and towers of their own, and the mists of bloated corpse flies that pass for weather here, and the plains are broken up by hills and a few, uh, fair few towers of bone. Of course, this place is just lousy with all sorts of demons and horrors and diseased sick things and pools and slimes and undead creatures. The Oiloth, who overlooked this wretched plain for thousands of years, is named Anthraxis, Long before he rose to the height of power, he made a deal with a coven of night hags who transformed him from his original Ultraloth form into a unique and mutated form of Yugoloth called the um, Ultraloth. I actually have a whole, um, they have a whole ritual for this transformation, which I have here. Well, let's see. The terms of the contract have to be agreed by both hags and the Yugoloth. The hags then fill a huge cauldron with water from the river Styx and mix in a load of putrid infernal lava these larvae, uh, which is the juvenile form of uh, fiends. 
I heat it up with a fire below the cauldron. This has to stay lit and keep the liquid bubbling away the entire time. So the hags typically use enslaved fire methods to keep it going and in goes the Yugoloth who is then sealed inside this with a slimy wax made from the residue of the putrid larvae. The hags then create a complex series of wards around the cauldron and begin the incantations to imbue the Yugoloth, their champion, with magical power. This process takes nothing less than an entire day for each incantation uh, and alteration they make to the Yugoloth's original form, and this magic is drawn from the night hag's own life force. So it's a serious business and they make damn sure that they get it right and are not interrupted and are very well protected while the ritual is underway as some of these transformations have taken up to a month to complete. Such as the one that created Charon, who's an ultraloth uh, whose name is actually Kerlik, uh, Serlik, the ferryman of the River Styx who was originally created to defeat an invasion of Geherella, uh, Gehelrith, Gehelriths who uh, were battling against the Marine Loths and thus totally disrupting the Hag's larvae trade across the River Styx. The Night Hags are severely depleted and in no shape to defend themselves for some time after the ritual, so they participate in the utmost secrecy and hide away for a long time to recover, putting some proxy doppelgangers in place to maintain the illusion that they are not drastically impaired. Meanwhile, inside the cauldron, the Yugoloth continues to transform. It takes up to six months for the incantations and vile fluid to complete its work, and then the entire cauldron explodes in a 25-foot blast of fire, hot metal shards, and caustic, virulently nasty, scalding lava juice, which you do not want to be anywhere near. And standing up from the epicenter rises the Ultraloth. It is powerful, but during the period covered by the contract with the Hags, its life is tied to theirs. If any of them die during its contracted deal, it dies as well. So the hags have a powerful protector while they are incapacitated and recovering. And since the Ultraloth probably doesn't know exactly who the specific hags are, it's wise for them to protect all night hags just to be on the safe side. The night hags essentially spend their hit dice to give the Ultraloth inherent spell like powers, additional uh, hit dice, enhanced attributes, physical changes to their size and appearance, immunity to certain attack types, increased magical resistance, enhancement of existing powers, and they can even alter its alignment, which has a lot of implications when you really think about it. Who knows how many distinctive creatures across the multiverse are actually transformed Yugoloths? Not too many, since it costs the Night Hags a great deal and they don't do anything without being very well compensated for their troubles. So. Anthraxus was born again. Those hags tasked him with a mission of destruction as payment for his transformation, and sent him to take on the Order of the Plains Militant, who were crusading paladins across the grey wastes of Hades, having been seriously offended by the hags' activities and mounting several large-scale holy crusades against them. Anthraxus was absolutely devastating and demonstrated a fact that stuck with many powers of the Lower Plains for a very long time, which is, one-on-one, -on -one, nothing can stand against him in combat, which I will explain why in a few minutes. So, he was super powerful and super successful and completed his mission in minus 1522 uh, 1, in the Dale Reckoning, then immediately went to the Wasting Tower and violently took control. In what has become his signature style, he made uses of the forces of good to his own evil advantage, and the former Oinoloth ended up imprisoned deep into the Underdark in the world of Earth home of the city of Greyhawk. Anthraxus earned his titles as the Lord of Despair and the Lord of Misery, and to all who looked on him in the flesh he earned his commonly known title, the Oino uh, Daemon Praxis the Decayed. I'm going to have to skip over a large chunk of lore on the trade in Infernal Larvae between Hades and Bartor uh, here, simply because it's kind of complicated and has been almost entirely ignored in 5th edition, but it is massively important and explains why the Night Hags and the Yugoloths are essentially untouchable by their other forces of evil. If you need some more info on that, let me know in the comments below and I will haul out Dragon Magazine Annual Number 2 and make another video for you. But, back to Anthraxis. Though not a lot is specifically known about his activities over his reign of 3,000 years, there is evidence that he continued to work both sides of the forces of evil and also the forces of good, such as when he uncovered the plans of a powerful Arcanoloth named uh, Yurkhetep, who was very active in the world of Toril, seeking to take control of the nations of Chondath and Termish, 
um, along with a branch of the Sea of Fallen Stars called the Vilhon Reach, in order to obtain items and allies in a bid to usurp Anthraxis from his throne. However, this failed thanks to Anthraxis manipulating a bunch of mortal adventurers to do his dirty work for him. Though they had no idea that he was behind their heroic deeds all along, secretly pulling the strings like they were his marionettes on a grand stage. Anthraxis was ousted by an alliance of Ultraloths, but it was their leader and their traitor who ended up betraying all of them named uh, Mydian Claris, who is the most mysterious in, uh, of them and in a spooky fashion, sometime between 1357 and 1369 DR, simply whispered a secret in Anthraxus' ear so pro profound and disturbing that Anthraxus just got up and left Kinoin, going on some quite a strange quest to ally himself Self with any of the evil gods of the lower planes, offering to serve them in a, as a proxy in what can only be concluded as an, uh, an intention to seek a path to true godhood. And all the while just seething with true hatred for uh, Mighty and Claris, for, I guess, destroying whatever passed for his twisted uh, peace of mind. Those of you wondering what that secret was, patrons can access a video where I talk about a profound secret of the D&D multiverse, the secret whispered by the Alips and covered at all costs Covered up at all costs by the lich god Vecna. Would you like to know more? <laughs> Anthraxus revealed the true extent of his dizzying degree of wealth during this time as he attempted to bribe gods into serving as their proxy. Eventually, once more using some manipulated adventurers, he followed their path of destruction into the very apex of Kinoin around 1379 DR and regained his throne, destroying the Ultraloth Usurper in the process. If you read a lot of the lore of uh, Anthraxus on the internet, um, it's a bit out of date and it doesn't cover this particular period. In his true form, Anthraxis is a 10 foot tall humanoid dressed in a grey suit of mouldering splendour. His head is that of a hideously deformed and diseased ram, constantly drooling a frothy spittle. His skin of his body is constantly seeping pus from thousands of blisters, pimples and boils. The matted ram fur peels away from it in chunks. Uh, fairly constantly, upsetting the boils which burst and spray thick yellow pus, exposing the raw flesh, bone and bloated organs beneath. He is quite capable of assuming the form of an Ultraloth when he wants to though, but it's just a magical guise. He speaks in a coughing, choking voice exactly like General Grievous, the Kalish uh, cyborg from Star Wars, and much like that character, it is his blinding speed in combat that makes him so formidable as well as the fact that any physical contact he makes with another being simply rots them away, thanks to his absolute mastery of diseases. He makes four physical attacks per round, as well as legendary attacks he takes on other creatures' turns during the round. Any successful strike inflicts wasting acid and necrotic damage against those, uh, and there's no saving throw unless they're immune to acid and disease. He can also grapple a victim and just melt them away to rancid muck and corroded bones. Even a glancing strike will inflict a target with a blistering disease that seems to uh, that boil out of them. Each round they take 1d4 damage, reducing the hit point maximum by that amount, uh, that much at the same time. And the blisters burst with highly contagious pus that will inflict uh, infect anyone that touches with the same condition without a hefty saving throw to save their lives. This may not sound too formidable, 1d4 damage per round, until you see him take out an entire army by having a method drop a tiny vial of pus into their water supply. Even those original paladins who were campaigning across the plains didn't stand a chance, as the disease requires the spells of at least 6 level to cure it. On top of this power of disease and the various powers of the Wasting Tower he controls, the many secret horrors contained within the Ancient Tower, and he has powerful artifacts he can make use of. One he owned for centuries called the Staff of the Lower Plains, which was powerful enough to transform the fiends of the Lower Plains back into their lowly larvae form. This artifact is currently missing, and many powerful Yugoloths are, as we speak, scouring the Lower Plains on the hunt for it. Chances are, when you think about it, Abraxas knows exactly where it is, and is the source of all these false leads, keeping his potential rivals busy and himself endlessly amused. The staff is made from the defiled bones of a pit fiend and a balor. It functions as a, let's see, in 5th edition this would be a staff of charming, plus it can cast the wish spell once per day and inflicts 3d6 plus 14 points of bludgeoning damage, but against fiends, they have to save if struck by it or get transformed into a lava. 
they are, though only a Night Hag or an Ultraloth can make use of this power. If a mortal picks the staff up with the intent of using it, they also have to make a saving throw or get transformed into the lava. To give you some idea of how much the staff is um, viewed in the lower planes, like the value of it, the price an Infernal Lord would pay to own it would dwarf the wealth of the entire planet of Toril. Here's the leader of the Yugoloths, who are not only the mercenaries of choice for most evil beings in the multiverse, they are fabulously wealthy. So essentially, Abraxas has damn near unlimited resources. If he can buy it, he has access to it. Not only that, these beings keep stock and trade in secrets. They have lists of the exact locations of powerful artifacts and war machines that probably should never have been made, let alone left in the lowest plane of Arctron to be covered in dust and forgotten. They know true names, they know the location and how to break into secret vaults of the forces of good and evil. So one doesn't simply walk into the lair of Abraxas and expect to fight him all by himself. No, no. You face him and his army. Make no mistake, demigods, demigods don't even entertain the notion. He has cultists, of course, and Thraxus's mortal cultists are marked with deforming diseases as a sign of their faith. On ritual occasions, they wear ro white robes and capes. Uh, with red sashes about their chests and waists. The high priests call themselves Degogs and wear bright red robes with black sashes and hoods. Those of greater rank in the Degogs wear black robes with red and gold sashes and hoods, all the way up to the Arch Degog, who, like most of the high priests, is transformed by Abraxas into a powerful but wretched form of life. We should be thankful for those hooded robes. They are found lurking hidden under the, uh, in underground shrines called conventicles, where they maintain flaming pentacles and the altars, w which usually have a blood-soaked sword thrust into them, perched over top of a fuming volcanic vent, if at all possible, and surrounded by a menagerie of deformed statues representing the leaders of the degoggery, as well as the various castes of the Yugoloth, and of course, Abraxas himself, perched over the altar in all his hideous glory, where his effigy can bear witness to the ritual sacrifices made in his honour. The Dagogs select victims who represent everything they hate, so youth, beauty, health, innocence and kindness are all high on the checklist. Cult ceremonies involve candles and long droning chants with low ominous tones of despair. Burning senses release thick yellow vapours in the air. There is really no skill check required to figure out that these robed creeps are richly deserving of some serious smiting. These cults sometimes serve both the god Nerul and Abraxas at the same time. Finally, Abraxas has magic, a lot of it, both in personal spell-like powers and his thousands of years of study of the mystic arts. He has the power to simply stare at a being less powerful than himself and transfix them, the power of his mind locking them into place, unable to act. He can fly at will, usually hovers around anyway, point at an object and animate it, cast lightning bolts, release a colour spray, gusts of wind, cloud kill, power words of pain and stun, all sorts of detection spells. He has true sight out to 120 feet, can create walls of fire, forces, uh, fire, force or ice, walk through a wall, plus several times a day he can create a firestorm and use the word, uh, power word kill spell. A formidable force in the multiverse. With his filthy fingers and so many evil plots, he either has a part in it or knows some fine details about just about every despicable scheme going on in the blood war and beyond. Even so, Anthraxis knows better than to push things to the point where the forces of Celestia are roused into action to deal with them once and for all, but more on them later. Please hit the like button if you made it this far, subscribe if you like what I do, check out my Patreon for some exclusive content and all the full scripts for these videos, buy some merchandise, wear your geek with pride and as always, thanks for listening and I'll be back with more for you very soon.